I'm Katie. And I'm Krista. We're so glad you've joined our online gathering here at Shoreline Community Church. Say hi in the comments, share a prayer need, and let us know where you're joining our gathering from today. Today we'll be hearing the next message in our series, Walk This Way, which will be followed by a time of worship. But before we get started, let's see what's coming up at SCC. God, what would you have us do? Who are you calling us to be? We follow Jesus here. We fulfill God's mission here. Here at Shoreline Community Church, we are all about becoming and making disciples of Jesus as we gather, grow, and go. If you're new, thank you so much for joining us today. If you're a first time visitor, we'd love to connect with you. So be sure to fill out a connect card and come to our welcome table in the lobby so we can give you a special gift. You can also find a digital connect card at shorelinecc.com or on the Church Center app. The connect card is a great way to get in touch with us and share your prayers and praises. Last Monday, we had one of our biggest fall events, Trunk or Treat. It was such a blast to see our church family show up in such a big way to bless families in our community. We saw some really incredible costumes and amazing car decorations. And there were over 120 families that came through. And we gave out over four huge tubs full of candy, 350 hot dogs, and about 600 prizes throughout the evening. What a great night. Thank you so much to everyone who helped plan, set up, volunteered during the event, and helped clean up. If you didn't get a chance to join this year, we hope you'll be there next year. And let's not forget to thank Isabel for all the hard work she put into her first trunk or treat here at SEC. Good job, Isabel. Ascent Youth meets up every Sunday at 6 p.m. to play games, hang out, worship, and become more like Jesus. And this is Pastor Tiffany's first week back, so you're gonna wanna be there. Yay! <laughs> youth Conference is on November 12th, so if you haven't signed up for Youth Conference, it is not too late. Tonight is also Encounter Prayer and Worship Night. We'll spend some time worshiping and praying in Southern Hall from 6 to 7 p.m. for Ascent Youth as they meet upstairs, so we'll see you there. This fall, we've been focusing on four local missions opportunities. Each month, SCC is engaging with a local ministry or outreach to bless and encourage the community around us. This November, we are partnering with Olive Crest to deliver Thanksgiving baskets to children and families in need. Right now, the best way to participate is to donate to our supplies fund. Whether you can give $5 or $500, you'll be making a difference by providing these families with food and activities to create meaningful holiday memories. You can donate by selecting 2022 Fall Missions Projects in the Giving tab on the Church Center app. Also, this month's Food for Kids Packing Party is today right after the gathering down by the Fireside Room. Every first Sunday of the month, we put together food packs to help feed kids in our community. Join us after the gathering in room 205. Thank you for your faithfulness in giving through your tithes and offerings. Your continued generosity not only makes our ministry here at Shoreline Community Church possible, but it also supports our missionaries locally and around the world. You can give at our in-person gatherings or online at shorelinecc.com and also through the Church Center app. The Church Center app also has all kinds of information about SEC groups and events and a Sunday morning tab where you can follow along with today's gathering. That's all for this week. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Instagram to stay connected. So as we head into the message, let's focus our hearts and minds by reading this call to worship together from Psalm 105. Give praise to the Lord, proclaim his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him, sing praise to him. Tell of all his wonderful acts. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. Now let's listen to the next message in our series, Walk This Way.
Everyone, welcome back. We're in week five. Can you believe that? We're only like two and a half weeks, three weeks to Thanksgiving. So it is, boy, we are just rolling along. And uh, I hope you're enjoying the series, Walk This Way. I'm enjoying the study, uh, the personal application. Uh, the first person that I preached to was myself, was just with the Lord and, and just really enjoying it. And this week in week five, we're coming in. And Paul, again, keep in mind that as we walk this way, Paul is addressing false doctrine. He's, a false, he's addressing false teaching in the church in Ephesus. And we've just had just a wonderful time talking about the culture and the context of what's happening and everything that's going on. And when, and when we hit this chapter 3, Paul is talking about the foundation and specifically with leaders. The health of the church is so important. I mean, Paul worked so hard to plant so many churches and so now he's looking at the foundation and he's looking at how these leaders are leading and how they're selecting leaders and what that looks about. And as we we're talking about the foundation, it made me think about my house. You've heard me talk about my house. I love my house. It's a 1940s uh, uh, house, but it needed a lot of work. And one of the things that we noticed when we walked in the kitchen, typically when you walk in a home, you walk through the kitchen and that's our home. I noticed that the floor was a little squishy, not something you want to experience and I knew that that would be on the punch list, some things that we would do. So uh, a couple months down the road, we started kind of digging into it. And what we found over the squishy areas was that instead of it being fixed, there had been layers and layers of plywood put over it. So it was the concept of, you know, it's a little weak. Let's just start laying it up. Let's start putting it down. Let's put a lot of nails into it. Let's put a lot of screws into it. And I had a friend who was helping me pull all that stuff up to see what was happening. And his comment was, man, there must have been a good deal on screws back in that day because they just screwed everything here and just put it everywhere. So, and it didn't work. It was still squishy. And what we found out when we get down to that subfloor is we found out there was actually a leak over along the side that was coming in that was taking care of it. And just like in our spiritual lives, it's no good to just cover things up. It's no good to come and just put layers upon layers upon layers. God loves us enough that he wants to get to the core. One of the big things in walking this way is having a good foundation, making sure that our feet are established on solid ground. So that's what we're doing here today. And so to do that, Paul, he's laying out the qualifications and the expectations of leaders. Leaders are a key part of every organization. Leaders are a key part of the body of Christ. So we're gonna dive in here. First Timothy chapter three, and I'm just gonna read the entire chapter and I encourage you to follow along. So stay with me in this. This is an essential part of our walk with Christ as we walk this way together with him. So it starts off 1 Timothy. Paul says, this is a trustworthy saying. If someone aspires to be a church leader, he desires an honorable position. So a church leader must be a man whose life is above reproach. We're gonna come back to that. It's a key statement. He's, Paul says he must be faithful to his wife. He must exercise self-control, live wisely, and have a good reputation. He must enjoy having guests in his home. I love that. And he must be able to teach. He must not be a heavy drinker or be violent. He must be gentle, not quarrelsome, and not love money. He must manage his own family well, having children who respect and obey him. For if a man cannot manage his own household, how can he take care of God's church? Verse 6, it says, A, a church leader uh, must not be a new believer because he might become proud and the devil would cause him to fall. Also, people outside the church must speak well of him so that he will not be disgraced and fall into the devil's trap. In the same way, deacons must be well-respected and have integrity. They must not be heavy drinkers or dishonest with money. They must be committed to the mystery of the faith now revealed and must live with a clear conscience. Before they are appointed as deacons, let them be closely examined. If they pass the test, then let them serve as deacons. In the same way, their wives must be respected and must not slander others. They must exercise self-control and be faithful in everything they do. Verse 12, a deacon must be faithful to his wife, and he must manage his children and household well. Those who do well as deacons will be rewarded with respect from others and will have increased confidence in their faith in Christ Jesus. And then Paul says, I'm writing these things to you now, even though I hope to be with you soon, so that if I am delayed, and he says, you will know how people must conduct themselves in the household of God. This is the church of the living God, which is the pillar and foundation of the truth. And then he says, without question, this is the great mystery of our faith. Christ was revealed in a human body and vindicated by the Spirit. He was seen by angels and announced to the nations. He was believed in throughout the world 
and taken to heaven in glory. Powerful chapter. We're not going to talk about everything in that chapter today because uh, you will leave at some point. So I'm going to dive into some key points. But the first thing I want to dive into is just how Paul values the body of Christ, the church. See, the church, the body of Christ is vital in our lives and in the community that we live in. And I think this is important that we are reminded of the importance of the body of Christ. We need to remind ourselves that we don't grow apart from the body. You separate any member from the body and it suffers and it dies. You know, I love what Oswald Chambers says. You know, he talks about this, this our, our desire to be individuals and to separate. He says indiv individuality counterfeits spirit spirituality, just as lust counterfeits love. God designed human nature for himself, but individuality corrupts that human nature for its own purpose. See, Growth is a process, and it can be painful, but we need the rest of the body in order to grow. I need you, you need me, we need each other. When a, when a part of the body is damaged, I mean, think about it. When my hand is hurting, it is connected to nerves and communication centers that communicate to the brain, and the brain puts into active things that need to be put in place so that my hand can be healed and get whatever, whatever it needs. This is why wherever the gospel is preached, New churches are established for the body of Christ to gather. The local church is the center of spiritual life in any community. And I love what Andy Stanley writes in his book, Deep and Wide. He says, the church is the local expression of the presence of Jesus. We are his body. And since people who are nothing like Jesus like Jesus, people who are nothing like Jesus should like us as well. There should be something about us that causes them to stand at the periphery and stare. Isn't that just a powerful comment? This is what Paul did. Wherever he went, Paul, he planted and he invested in churches. We, 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 we know from the Gospels that Paul planted over 14 churches. See, the church, this is God's method of reaching the community. Because after all, if we don't gather together well, if we're not encouraging one another well, we're not going to scatter. We're not going to be effective salt and light that the Lord has called us to be. See, a community is only as spiritually healthy and alive as local churches are spiritually healthy and alive. Just like you can often measure the physical health of a community by looking to its hospitals, looking to its healthcare professionals. If they are compromised, the health of a community is compromised. Much like us as the body of Christ coming together, the integrity of the local church is vital. And so that's why in this letter, the Apostle Paul He's starting at the top, and he's putting this emphasis in this chapter on the integrity of the leaders. These are elders and, and deacons, the offices of the church. See, leadership has requirements. Leadership has requirements. Any community that you're part of, any organization that you're part of, if they're doing well, if they're flourishing, they put a lot of thought into the leaders. This is universal. I mean, we know without organization, there's chaos. And God is a God of organization. There is no chaos with our God who made us. And so Paul, he stresses the need for organization throughout his letters. And Jesus, he even stressed the need for organization. And he used principles in how he led his disciples, how he ministered upon, uh, upon this earth. And even today, throughout some of the greatest businesses of the world, you can see these effective leadership principles of Jesus. And it goes all the way back to the beginning. In the Garden of Eden, God set up Adam and Eve and made them stewards and gave them responsibility, gave them leadership tasks and things to do. I love what it says in Ephesians 5, in Ephesians chapter 4, rather. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 4, Paul, he lays out the purpose of leaders when he says, Now these are the gifts that Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, the teachers. Paul said the responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and to build up the church, the body of Christ. Paul said this will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord. That's the goal, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Then we will no longer be immature children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. That's what was happening there in the church in Ephesus. He said we will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit perfectly together. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. 
See, this is the purpose of leaders, to equip, to strengthen the body of Christ uh, so that we will be mature. So as Paul says, that we're not blown, we're not tossed, we're not taken off track by lies that sound so clever because they have a little bit of truth but a whole lot of lie in it. He's saying this is the goal of leaders um, to come in and bring this maturity. And so this is what Paul is doing here with the Church of Ephesus. Remember, he's addressing false teaching, bad doctrine, doctrine that is infiltrating the church. And as it relates to the false doctrine that is happening, Paul is addressing to it by going right to the top. And he's very directly addressing issues with them in the local church. He's not mixing his words. He's not gently going around the, around the perimeter, but essentially he is clearing house. And as it relates to the leaders, he's focusing on two key groups here. The first one that he called is elders. Elders, these are their overseers. These, these are what we would call here our, our pastors. They're the ones that oversee the ministry. And then he addresses this other group called deacons. Uh, deacons, these are the people that we would refer to as our, our, our Shoreline Community ch uh, Church Board. Um, our bylaws were created by this passage. When you look at our constitution and bylaws for our our church, it's this passage is all the way throughout in our leaders and the qualifications and expectations. You know, our bylaws state that deacons, they serve this assembly, Shoreline Community Church, and act in an advisory capacity assisting the pastor in all matters pertaining to this assembly. His spiritual life and the ministry of, of his ordinances, they're involved in ministry of prayer and service to the members and adherents of the assembly, including the distribution of assistance and scriptural help to those in need, to the widows, the orphans, the poor. This is what the Bible calls pure religion, is loving those in need. Now, I love being pastor. One of the things that, um, that I love is that every day I get to go, get up and be a part of what God is doing through this local body that I've had such a wonderful history with. But as it relates to being pastor, this is not something that I ever sought out. From a young child, I never had this goal of one day being a pastor. It's something that has is, that is always seemed to seek me and that the Lord has guided my steps and directed me in this way. Now, for me, I've always loved my pastors. I've, always, I've had some wonderful leaders who poured into my life. But I think one of the reasons why it wasn't something that from a young age and even as I continue to grow that I sought out is because I saw I got the small slice of the pressure that would be up on the local pastors, the, the things they were walking through, the things they were struggling with, uh, the criticism that they would receive from others, the way that they would be misunderstood. And this pressure and this weight, it is normal for every spiritual leader. It's normal for every leader, but I think especially within the body of Christ. And this weight has been especially heavy during the past three years. And the weight of this pressure has had a huge price with leaders, with pastors uh, throughout the nation and throughout the world. COVID and the pressures from inside as, as well as outside the church has contributed to one of the biggest resignations from pastoring that, I'm, that I have seen in my lifetime. And even his stories, when they look back, they've seen this, this great exodus because of the pressure, because of all the things that have happened. See, our enemy, Satan, he will leverage whatever he can to take down the body of Christ and the fastest way to often take down a community is to take down its leaders. You know, I often tell my leaders, when you become a leader, you need to recognize there's a target on your back. You're targeted because we serve in that protective capacity. We serve in that leadership that, um, where we surround and we're active in doing the ministry. And just like any great uh, uh, commander that we know from history, if you take down the leader, you can take down the army. So in this passage, Paul is addressing this. And he's looking to the leaders. He's, he's, he's telling, he's instructing Timothy to instruct the leaders. And he gives them this key to succeeding as a leader. One of the key things and a way to succeed, recognizing that you're going to come under attack, recognizing there are false teachers, there's false things infiltrating the church. And he speaks to Timothy to give this instruction. And it's the instruction to be above reproach. To be above reproach. This is 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2. See, Paul knows the weight of ministry. You know, as so many of us have gone through such a difficult time, you know, Paul, he writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 of just some of the challenges he's been through. He said, I've been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, been exposed to death again and again. He said, five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, danger from bandits, danger from my fellow Jews. 
in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. You had to be careful <laughs> with Paul. He seemed to be in danger all the time. He said, I've labored and I've toiled, and I've often gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst, and I've gone without food. I've, I've been cold and I've been naked. Besides everything else, he said, I face the daily pressure of my concern for all the churches. Now, I felt a lot of pressure in my time, but I can't rattle off a list like that. And here's what Paul is saying. He's saying, I've felt the pressure. I've been through the difficulty. But he keeps coming back and he's saying, but I do it because there's such a need and a priority for the leadership. And he's, he's invested so much of his life in investing in other leaders, in investing in young pastors, young deacons that will rise up and be a part of building the body of Christ because we need it. Jesus established it from the beginning of time. The early church established these new gatherings, house churches, meeting wherever they could because we need it. And Paul is saying that in the middle of this, there's false teaching that's happening that needs to be addressed. And it's a teaching that tries to depend on yourself instead of depending on the Lord. And Paul is saying, you can't make it this way. And so he points to something very practical. He gets very practical. If you've been with us in 1 Timothy, you know that he's not mincing words. He's just, he's getting to the point and it's just like he's just listing it off and he's going, even if you have a hard time reading, I don't want you to, want you to miss this. And he's correcting it. And the key thing that he's giving them is he's saying you need as a leader to live a life that is above reproach. Now, what does this mean? What does it mean to live a life that is above, report, above reproach? Well, Paul, he lays it out. See, when he talks about being above reproach, he's talking about the observable conduct of a person's life. These are things that you look at somebody and you see them. And he's doing this because this was the instruction of Jesus. Matthew chapter 7, Jesus said, beware of false prophets. This is exactly what Paul is addressing here. Jesus said, beware of false prophets who come disguised as harmless sheep, but are really vicious wolves. And then Jesus said, you can identify them by their fruit, that is, by the way they act. And then in verse 20, he said, yes, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, so you can identify people by their actions. See, Jesus here is addressing false leaders and false prophets, and he's, and he's saying to pay attention to the fruit of their lives. It is so important that we pay attention to those health markers of everybody, but especially with leaders. And I wanna make a little note here. Jesus is not saying that leaders have to be perfect. Every perfect leader, raise your hand and just quickly put it down because we're not. No one is perfect. And Jesus even said, no one is good except for God. See, we are all in process. Even Jesus' disciples were not perfect, but they were committed to Christ. They'd oriented their life towards Jesus under his care, surrendered to him. And in that process, Jesus began to perfect his work. It's a lifetime process. So today I'm not preaching a gospel of you must be perfect, but it's surrendering and recognizing that we need to pay attention because if the fruit is bad, there's something off in our life that needs to be addressed. And the beauty of the gospel is that God takes sinners like me, sinners like you, and he transforms us as we surrender to him. This is the process. So what does above reproach look like? Well, Paul, he starts off, by looking at one of the most important relationships in our life, and that's our spouse. He says that you must be faithful to your wife. Now, this is a key relationship that reveals a lot about a person, and this is the first relationship that Paul points to. See, Paul is essentially saying, what does their spouse have to say about them? You know, how are they treating them? As it relates to loving your neighbor, for those of you that are married, your closest neighbor will always be your spouse. This is the illustration that the Bible gives in how we relate to the Lord. It's, it's this marriage, this covenant relationship. And as it relates to leaders, our walk with God is, is vital, and, but it's, it's to empower us to love our spouse, to love our spouse. And so Paul's saying this is a key marker. Secondly, now he moves to being good managers of herself. He says that he must exercise self-control, live wisely, and have a good reputation. See, if you, we, if you can't manage yourself, how can you manage somebody else or manage an organization or walk in that way? How can you lead others? 
This was, a Je- this, this was the criticism that Jesus had for the religious leaders of that day, the, the, the Pharisees. He said that they know the ways of God, but they don't practice it. So then Jesus said, don't follow them. Don't follow them. See, it's not just about knowing things. It's not about attaining knowledge. We can get all the knowledge we want and more. It's about applying the truths of God to our life and then living them out. And then he moves on to how we treat others. Paul writes, for leaders, he must enjoy having guests in his home. See, this is about building relationships. I mean, how many times did Jesus, sometimes he invited himself, sometimes he received an invitation from others, but he spent a lot of time in the homes of other people. See, a home is where we relax. A home is where we really get to know people, where we set all agendas aside, and where they're just focused on the conversation, focused on each other. So many of his great teachings and his great illustrations were done. So many of his miracles were done in the home of others. Because with Jesus, this is all about building relationship. See, leadership within the body of Christ is unlike any other leadership position in that we often use the word that it's like family. For me, I know as a pastor at Sterling Community Church, uh, I work here, uh, I lead here, I develop relationships here, uh, and I have people that I meet with in my office, but I also have people that I meet with, with in my home. And Some of my very closest friends have been people that are here at the church, and you're probably watching me right now. Now, why is that? Well, it's that way because this is the way of Jesus. It's a whole life. See, Jesus, that's why he said to his disciples, he said, I no longer call you servants. Jesus said, I call you, fr-, excuse me, he said, I call you friends. It's in John 15, 15. See, our love for God is measured by our love for people. That's something you'll hear us consistently talk about because it's one of the key fruits. We can tell if someone has a high love for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, by the way that we treat those around us, recognizing everyone around us. And this is tough. This can be very tough. Using the example of Jesus, some of his closest friends were the ones who sold him out. Some of the people that Jesus um, spent the most time with and invested were the ones that, that were a part of killing him. It can be very difficult, and I think if we're not careful, it can cause us to back away, but Jesus is leading us, and Paul is instructing us here. Because as it relates to this, this is the fruit of our lives. And this is not the whole list. This is just the, the first three key areas. But these areas, they address how we manage ourselves, how we treat those closest to us, and how we love those around us. And these are three of the essential key fruits of every godly leader. If we're pursuing God and how we live and how we lead our lives, this evidence should be here. And Paul, he's addressing these areas Because these are the areas that have been compromised in the local church there in Ephesus. They've either been compromised or they've been attacked or they're missing from areas of... Because again, don't forget, Paul, he's addressing a false teaching that says it doesn't matter how you live. The false religions of that day were more about knowledge or more about practice or more about trying to get what you want. But there was a separation between your religion and your life. And Paul is saying that that this false teaching that will, that will say, well, as long as you agree, as long as you raise your hand and say, yep, that's right, then everything is okay. And unfortunately, this is a false teaching of today as well, where it's, it's a teaching as long as we know the right things and as long as we just say the right things, then it's okay. But walking with Jesus is a complete surrender. There's a transformation that takes place of our life. My life before Jesus is different than my life after Jesus and with Jesus. Now, same body, same Dwayne, but now everything is conformed. Everything is transformed to the power of Jesus Christ. See, the fruit of Jesus in our lives is only achieved through Jesus living in our lives. And for Jesus to live in me, that means that I must die to myself. That means every decision, the things I watch, the things I do, the things I say, the choices I make, I'll begin with Jesus, what would you have me do? Holy Spirit, lead me, empower me today. Because see, when I walk in this way, I'm aligned with Christ under his power, under his authority. I'm walking in a way that is now equipped. When we talk about walking this way, we're talking about being equipped by a life that is surrendered to Jesus Christ. Again, this is not about just having the right position on issues. This is about having the right relationship 
the relationship with God, loving God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and then loving our neighbor as ourself, sacrificially. See, it's not about being informed. It's about being transformed. Transformed life, filled with the power of God, filled and transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Remember, the Holy Spirit is an empowerment to do the mission that God has given us. And the more that a person grows in leadership, the greater the weight and the greater the responsibility that a person carries. And this is a weight that as spiritual leaders, as leaders within the body of Christ, that we can't carry on our own. We're never meant to carry on our own. See, Jesus said, come unto me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And then he says, how? He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. We take on his yoke. When we do it in ourselves, when we feel the rubbing, it needs to be a sign to us that we're out of alignment. We're out of alignment. Just like I love the backpack. And every time I go with somebody backpacking, they often have problems with their backpack because they're trying to carry it on their shoulders. But if you go into REI or whatever your favorite store is, anybody who knows what they're doing, they will tell you, no, this is just meant to guide it. There's a hip belt. You're meant to carry it on your hip. There's a better way of doing it. And as soon as I adjust that for people, it's like this burden was off. They can see the trees. They can see the eagles. They're enjoying it versus just trying to struggle and make it. This is our walk with our Lord, taking his yoke on. And before we wrap this up today, I want to encourage you to take note of what Jesus did. When his disciples came to him and said, Jesus, it's not working. Jesus, I'm tired. I'm exhausted. When they came to Jesus with these problems, what were the things that he did? He would send them to prayer. He would say, you need to pray. Because see, when we pray, we're surrendering our lives. We're filling our lives with the voice of God, with the power. And then Jesus, he told his disciples that one of the last things Jesus said, he said, I want you to go and wait. Wait for the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. It reminds me of the words of Isaiah when Isaiah wrote, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Do you need your strength renewed today? Maybe you're leading today and you're looking at this and going, boy, I love leading it, but it, it can be so hard sometimes. It can be so heavy. Let me encourage you. Wait on the Lord. But to wait on the Lord, you need to stop. Sometimes we need to pull to the side. Sometimes we need to step out for a season. Sometimes we need to position our lives to where we can just, just wait in his presence, be refreshed. We need this. See, we need to empty ourselves because there's too much junk in our lives. Sometimes junk that we've put in, sometimes junk we've allowed other people to put in. But we need to empty, we need to be poor in spirit. That's what Jesus said at the beginning of his Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Because as we empty ourselves of all things, this is where he fills us with his power, with his presence and the power of God. Amen? Amen. So before we go and we worship with the team today, several reflection questions that I really encourage. I meet so many people who are tired, so many people that uh, are just exhausted, but they want to walk forward. They, they want to receive this, this word when it says in John 10, 10, this life to the full. A couple questions I encourage you to ask now in this moment and to carry with you through the week is, first of all, Ask yourself, how am I doing in the three key areas that are supposed to produce fruit in my life? Remember family. How am I treating my family, my spouse, my kids, those closest to me? How am I doing with myself? That being self-controlled. And, and it lay, I encourage you to read through that chapter again. He lays out several areas where self-control, not being given to anger. And then with my neighbor, how am I doing in loving and inviting others into my home? Sometimes we're so busy. Sometimes we're, there's so many other things taking place that we've not made room for our neighbors. Take this this week and pray through and say, God, Holy Spirit, speak to me. Show me. And then my second question to you would be, where are you today? Are you, do you find yourself exhausted today? As I talk about trying to do it on your own, do you resonate with that? Where you're like, boy, I just feel like I'm doing it on my own. Well, if you're exhausted and trying to do it on your own, a good way to evaluate it is to ask yourself, how's my connection to God? Am I spending time in prayer? Am I, am I seeking him? Am I putting him first in all things? And then asking yourself, how's my connection to the church? We need to be connected to the body of Christ. We need each other. 
And then of course that last step, what steps do I need to take? What needs to change? What action steps do I need to take place? And I would encourage you that if you're looking at this and you have more questions than answers, get with somebody. Talk to somebody in your group. Reach out to one of us. We'd love to connect with you. You can fill out a connection card. You can put it in a comment. You can email us at info at shorelinecc.com, but don't walk alone. The Lord has so much more for you. Receive his healing. Receive his word and receive his empowerment today. Amen. So, Lord, I pray for my friends watching today. Everyone watching, Lord, these are people that you have made, you have created. I pray they would hear this word from you today, this, this, this strengthening, that, um, that this call that you've placed on all of our lives. That, Lord, as we move forward, so many are weary, so many are tired. Jesus, I pray that we would hear your voice to come unto you, all who are weary and heavy laden, because you will give us rest as we take off our yoke and we place on the yoke you've given us, walking with you, step in step with you, I pray in your name. Amen. Let's join the worship team now as we worship together in spirit and truth.
Thank you so much for joining us today. It's I love getting con to connect online. For some of you, this may be your weekly habit of coming. For some of you, maybe you're on vacation or you're traveling and this is a way of staying in touch. But boy, however you're doing it, be sure to reach out. Send a comment, let us know that you're there. We'd love to connect with you. We need to connect together. Again, with the comments, connection card, info at shorelinecc.com, you know all the ways. Let's connect. Download the Church Center app. Let's be connected. We need each other as the body of Christ as we walk forward. So as we wrap it up, this is our benediction. Let's say this together. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. That's my prayer for you today as now you go and you live for Jesus. God bless you all. We love you very much. Thank you.